The OSPF network command can be a bit tricky. You should have just practiced that in lab. In this video, I'll go over the choices you could have made and talk about the correct configuration. Let's jump in. The lab I'm talking about in this video is about content you'll find in the official CERT guide, Volume 1, Part 6, Chapter 22. So what is this lab? I have config labs at my blog. This one's named OSPF Network Config 1. It focuses on the OSPF network command. There's a direct link to the lab, and by now you should have done the lab. If you haven't, go ahead and open up that blog post and work through that up to the point where you've gotten into Packet Tracer and done the lab. This review video is about reviewing the answer and explanation. So you can use the blog post and ignore the videos and read about what to do, do the lab, review your answers in sequence. But I've created both an intro and answer video for this lab, so if it's useful to you, watch the rest of this review video, where I give more detail and take a more systematic approach to the answer than I do in the blog post. So if that's what you're interested in, let's dive in. For this lab, we use a simple topology with only two routers, but with two scenarios. So for this first scenario, we needed to configure the router IDs you see here, the requirements said to use the config command in router config mode to configure those. We put all the interfaces in area 0, and we're supposed to use process ID 20. So what's the config look like? Well, the simple parts of this, we both got router OSPF 20 commands to create the OSPF process. We both have router ID commands with their respective router IDs. On the left, we see one network command, and on the right, we see two. And that's the detail we need to work through, those network commands. So let's do that. We'll start with router R1. It's got two interface addresses, right? And we've got this one network command, and that network command matches both interfaces. But we have specific requirements from the lab that I just made up in order to force us into one and only one correct answer for this first scenario and to give you different kinds of practice to make you think about different options. And the requirement was this. Your network command has to use a wildcard mask so that the command matches all addresses in one class full network. That is one class A, class B, or class C network. So let's talk about that matching logic. As configured with this wildcard mask of three zeros and a 255, we ignore, we tell the router to ignore the fourth octet. That is, it's masked out. So with this address value of 192.168.4.0, the fourth octet is ignored. So what the router does is say, hey, do I have any addresses on interfaces that begin 192.168.4? Well, if we compare that to, say, the WAN interface address, 192.168.4.1, well, of course, it matches. It doesn't match in the fourth octet, but we don't care about that octet. That's what we've told the router with this wildcard mask. The three octets we do care about, the first three, there's a match, and that enables OSPF on the interface with that IP address. But notice, that same logic, matching all addresses that begin 192.168.4, also matches the LAN interface on the left side of router R1. So we've met the artificial lab requirement of all addresses in class C network 192.168.4, and this one command has matched both interfaces. Then if we turn our attention over to router R2's configuration, the answer config shows two network commands, and here's why. If we use that same network command logic we just saw, and we go through the comparison, say, to the WAN address, which is on the left side of router R2, 192.168.4.2, there is indeed a match between the first three octets, and we don't care about the fourth octet, so it's a match of this left-hand interface, but it does not match, that first network command does not match the LAN interface on the right side of R2, because notice it's in a different class C network. It's in class C network 192.168.2, and of course the number 2 in that third octet doesn't match up with the address field, right? It's different, so it's not a match. So you needed another network command, and there you go. We've got a different network command whose first three octets are 192.168.2 with that same wildcard. That one 
matches the right hand interface. Now, if you left out that network command, here's what happens. R2 does not enable OSPF on this right hand interface and it does not advertise about that subnet over to router R1. R1, for instance, would not have been able to ping this remote destination subnet or this IP address in that remote destination subnet from R1. I'm going to walk through this lab with you again. I'm just going to show you the completed configuration that's already been configured in lab. Then I'm going to walk through a few show commands to show that OSPF is enabled on all those interfaces and they're in the correct area. R1 and R2 should become OSPF neighbors. We'll confirm that. And then, of course, we want to look at routes, right? So I'll look at the routes. We'll see that both routers have routes to all three of these subnets, right? And two of those routes are going to be connected routes. But one of those is going to be the OSPF route for the far away subnet. All right, let's jump in and do that. I've gone ahead and opened the packet tracer file. And I've opened a file that's got the correct config configuration already loaded into it. So here's router R1. And we'll just start right away with a show running config command. And I'm going to hit space bar a few times and work through. But the OSPF commands don't appear till the very bottom, or near the bottom. Router OSPF 20, just like we reviewed. Router ID 1111, just like we reviewed. And then a single network command, 192.168.40, with three zeros and a 255 for the wildcard mask, placing interfaces in area zero. Then over on router R2, it's a similar output, but with two network commands here, on router R2. So that matches up to what we saw in the PowerPoint slide recording, right? So what about status, right? So I promised that we'd take a look at the different status. So what do we expect? Well, first off, let's see if it looks like it's enabled. Show IP OSPF int brief. And we see OSPF is enabled. Let me widen that out just a little more. Interfaces only show up here if OSPF is enabled on the interface. So we see gig01 and gig02. We see the interface IP addresses. We see the process ID and areas of 20 and 0, respectively. So that's a pretty good confirmation that we've enabled OSPF on the interfaces. We'd see something similar over on router R2. And we've confirmed the area. What about neighbors? Show IP OSPF neighbor. We see neighbor... 2222, two, two, two. it's in a full state, which is the state we would expect it to be in with just two neighbors on the link. How about routes? We'll start with show IP route OSPF, and router R1 sees one OSPF learned route. Router R2 sees one OSPF learned route. What are they? Well, let me scroll up a bit, move around. We see the route to 192.168.2.192. That's R2's LAN subnet over on router R1. On router R2, we see the subnet 192.168.4.128, which is the LAN on the left side of router R1 in our diagrams. Now, just to round it out, we'll look at the whole routing table here. So we see our OSBF learned route to the far away subnet, and we see a connected route to the WAN subnet and the connected route to the LAN subnet on router R1. We'd see the equivalent over on router R2. For the second scenario, I changed the requirements of how you should configure the network command. So if you did this in Packet Tracer, you should have removed the old network commands and added these in. So the requirements for the router IDs are the same, and the OSPF areas are the same, and the process ID are the same. But different requirements for the network commands, and here are the answers. So the requirement was that you match all addresses in the subnet of the interface. So for this interface, match in one network command, match all addresses in the subnet. For this one, all addresses in that subnet. So I'm expecting two network commands per, and we see two in the config on each router. R2 matches all addresses in its left-hand subnet, then all addresses in its right-hand subnet with two separate network commands. 
Now, if you look at those network command address and wildcard mask values, you may say, oh, I'm not so sure how I would have gotten that. So let me tell you how to do that. I didn't even tell you this in the explainer video. So here's the deal. You start with the interface, IP address, and mask. And what you want to come up with is derive the values to plug in the network command that matches all addresses in the subnet, right? That's the goal. So there's the address and subnet mask for one interface. Next up, via what you've already learned, calculate the subnet ID. So now I've just changed the address to the subnet ID for that subnet. That's going to be the first number you code in the network command, all right? That's the lowest number in the subnet, you might recall, and that's important. Then you do this thing called inverting the subnet mask. That's a math operation, and when you invert the subnet mask, you get the correct value to use as the wildcard mask when you're matching all addresses in the subnet. I'll show you that here in just a second. So it turns out if you invert 255.255.240, you get 00015. Now those are the two values to plug in your network command. So network 192.168.40.00015, and then it ends in area zero to place the interface in area zero. All right, so how did I come up with this inversion thing? Well, using nice easy decimal math, here's the deal. We had calculated the subnet ID. We've got our dotted decimal mask, subnet mask here. 2 divide, 2 divide, 2 divide dot 40. And we subtract that from 255s. That's all you got to do. So octet by octet, we subtract. 255 minus 255 is 0, 0, 0. 255 minus 240 is 15. And there's your wildcard mask to use in the network commands. So if I work through all four of those interfaces on R1, gig 0, 2, and gig 0, 1, and likewise, and if I just look at the addresses and the subnet mask, well, the subnet masks were all the same. So when I do that math to invert the subnet mask, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get the same wildcard mask in each case. When I do the math to find the subnet IDs, I'll get these values, respectively. And that's what ended up in our four network commands. I'll give you a chance here to pause and compare these answer configs again at the bottom to that table up at the top, but that's where the math came from to come up with these network commands. That completes our review of the lab. Thanks for hanging around through to the end. Hope you enjoyed doing the lab and digging a little deeper here in the review video. If you're new, I always try to follow up with review exercises like this, so click subscribe, click the bell, get notified of new videos like this. Hope you're having a great time studying for CCNA. I'll talk to you soon.